Hello, welcome to our new lesson on organic chemistry. Now in this lesson, I'm going to share with you some of the details and the key points on organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is one of the hot topics in KCC. I call them hot topics because in uh, the past like 10 years of exams, we found that organic chemistry has been having about 15 to 20 marks overall for paper one and two. And if you added paper three, which would be most likely a question three in paper three, that would be about another 10 marks. So you could imagine that if you have mastered organic chemistry, you could be sure of at least scoring somewhere between 30 to 40 marks of your overall grade, all the way from paper one to paper three. So let's get it started. Now, the first thing that you should remember about organic chemistry is that it is divided into three major parts. It's divided into three major parts. So the first major part that we talk about is uh, the part of homologous series. Now for the homologous series, just know there are six of them. We start off with the alkanes. And the alkanes have this uh, general formula of CnH2n plus two. Then you go for the next one is the alkenes. And the alkenes have a general formula of CnH2n. Then you have the alkynes, which have a general formula of CnH2n minus two. This one is typically, you are according to your syllabus, the organic chemistry one. Then we shift gears to the second organic chemistry topic, which is now going to be as alkanols. Now for the alkanols, the general formula, we shall be taking note of the functional group. So I'll put it out and have Cn, H to N plus one, and then have OH. The OH is the functional group. Generally speaking, this one is actually an alkyl group which can be represented by the letter R, and therefore sometimes we just say ROH. This is the typical one that you'll be writing in your paper three. Then you go to the next homologous series, which is the alkanoic acids. Now in the alkanoic acids, again, I'm going to branch, branch out and give you the CNH to N minor plus one, then we have the C double O O H. So this one again is an alkyl group, which can be represented by R, which is now an R C O O H. So this is the general way of writing the alkanoic acid. Now I said six of them, but when you count here, you find that we have one, two, three, four, and five. The sixth homologous series that we talk about are known as esters. Esters, these ones, they are formed by the esterification, which alkanols and alkanoic acids combine in the presence of concentrated sulfuric six acid and a little bit of warming, and you get esters. So the general formula would be R, and then we have C double bond O, and then O, and then R prime, where R is representing an alkanoic part, this one comes from the alkanoic acid. And this other R prime is an alkyl group derived from the alkanol. And this little part here is where we have the ester link, which you should be very much aware of. So generally speaking, when you start off with organic chemistry, you must be aware of all these six homologous series. Then I will be dealing with the details going in one on one. Now, how do you best revise this homologous series? These homologous series are best revised using a very important method we call the mind map, we call the mind map. Mind maps, very, very important when you're dealing with homologous series. You cannot go wrong with mind maps because if you can make one, then even if they give you any question on organic, you're going to get it right. Now, let's move on to the next part. This is the first part of organic chem. The second part of organic chemistry 
This one now would be the part we call the detergent side. So let me just give this one a different color and say detergents. Now, detergents, here we have two kinds. We have the soapy detergents and the soapless detergents. So soapy detergents. These ones, of course, should remember about the examples and how the formula looks like. So general formula of a soapy detergent is, you will start off with an R, which is an alkyl group. Then you end up with a COO and then NA. That one is uh, the soapy detergent. Then you go to the soapless detergent. The surplus detergent, then here we'll have our R, but then it is going to be joined up with an S and then with some double bond O, double bond O, then you have another O and A. Now, usually put a negative P and a plus here just to show that the soap has both the alkyl or the non-polar alkyl group, then the polar end. Alternatively, the surplus detergent could have this general formula where it is now having the benzene ring. And then of course, you could get to now the S double bond O, O and then O and A. So these ones, they are the two structures of the soapy and the soapless detergents. Important things to remember about the soapy and soapless detergents is that you need to be aware of, number one, how they are prepared, preparation of these soaps. So usually soapy detergents, we get them from uh, the action of fatty acids and uh, strong alkali. And then we got um, the soapless detergents which are prepared from petroleum products. Then another important thing you must remember about the soapy and soapless detergents is the cleansing action, cleansing action. So this is how does soap remove grease from cloth or that from cloth, that's the most important. Then finally, the third key part on this one is uh, the effect of hard water on soap. Of course, it's both soapy and soapless detergents that we'll be talking about here. So generally, this is our second part of organic chemistry. And then the final part of organic chemistry is the polymers, polymers. Now for the polymers, let me give it a different color now. Probably green would be good. So here we have the third part, which is the polymers. For the polymers, you need to remember that you have two types of polymers. So we start with the types. Number one type is called the natural polymers, natural polymers. Now, natural polymers, these ones include things like cellulose, things like silk. Those ones are natural polymers. And then we have the synthetic polymers. Synthetic polymers, these ones include some polymers like the PVC, polyvinyl chloride. We have the, we have the, the let me say polyethylene polyethylene or polythene. We also have things like terylene. We also have others like uh, the PTFE. PTFE stands for polytetrafluoroethene. That one is the non-stick frying pan that you can use for frying some omelet without sticking on a pan. Very good. Now, in the polymers, we also have polymerization. And now polymerization is also divided into two. So the polymerization, we have the addition polymerization. And then we also have what is known as condensation polymerization. So as you can see, we just divide the topic into three major parts and it becomes so manageable. Right now, whenever you're revising organic chemistry, divide it into those three parts and dive deep 
into all the details for each of the sections. It is very, very easy. Now, I would like to get dive deep into the mind map section. I would leave you to work on the detergents and polymers, but then I want to show you a very important strategy we call the mind map. So for the mind map, well, all you need to do is first of all, go and revise, revise thoroughly what you have been taught in chemistry, organic chemistry. Then come back and look at it as a form of revision by use of a flow diagram. So in chemistry, we always get flow diagrams as part of the questions. Now we want to become the creators of flow diagrams. And creating a flow diagram is not that hard. It's all about the properties of these different homologous series. So let us start off with an example here. I would always like to start off with ethene because it's the simplest alkene and it can easily branch out to many different areas. So let's see. We start off in the middle of a blank page with the compound ethene. And ethene has the formula of C2H4. Now this one, I think we can do it like this. Let me just change the color and box it in. So we start asking ourselves, well, how is ethene prepared? Well, we could say ethene can be prepared from the dehydration of ethanol. So we could put ethanol on this other side. And ethanol is a C2. H5OH, I box it in and put process. When ethanol is dehydrated, we end up with ethene. And the dehydration process usually occurs in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid. So I'll put here sulfuric acid. If I put in the liquid state, it tells me it is concentrated. So it's a shorter way of remembering that it's concentrated sulfuric acid, as opposed to writing the whole word concentrated. Another important thing about dehydration of ethanol is that it takes place temperatures of 160 degrees C to 180 degrees C. So that is the beginning of our mind map. Now let's look at ethanol. Mm. Ethanol can also have its own properties and you could branch out from there. But my main focus today is on the ethene molecule. So ethene can also become ethanol through a process we call, yes, you guessed it right, hydrolysis. So going backwards like this, we have another process we call the hydrolysis. Well, I think even I should color code these ones. Let me just modify it so that you can see what we can do here. Let me erase this one and this one. And then now I color code them so that the blue coming backward is same color and then the red going forward is the same color so that there's no confusion. Good, so hydrolysis is the process where ethene can be converted to ethanol. And these are two-step process. So you should remember this is a two-step process. So I can write there two-step. Whereby in the first place, we start off with the uh, ethene reacting with concentrated sulfuric six acid. So again, you see right here, sulfuric six acid with the liquid state to show it is concentrated. And then we need to add some water because we're dealing with hydrolysis. So water, and of course, a little bit of warming will do the trick. So this way, we have already depicted two processes of converting ethanol to ethene and ethene back to ethanol. Now we can proceed and talk about something about ethene. How about we talk about the addition reaction? Hmm. Let's talk about addition of chlorine. So I'll use another color here. Let's say now we're going this way. And here now we're dealing with addition. Now, what are we adding? One mole of chlorine. When I add one mole of chlorine to ethene, I'll end up with one, two, dichloroethane. Now it becomes an alkane. 
So this one is going to be a one comma two hyphen dichloro ethane. Now this compound that has been formed is formed from the process of addition reaction. So that's an addition process. This process will have no special conditions, will just happen at room temperature and pressure. Another important thing we can do here, we can talk about hydrogenation where we are now adding hydrogen. So let's look at this one. We go this way and we add hydrogen. The process is called hydrogenation. And of course, the same type of reaction is called hydrogenation. Like here, type of reaction is addition reaction for the one chlorine. Type of reaction here is hydrogenation. Process is still hydrogenation. Now for hydrogenation, it takes place in the presence of nickel catalysts and a temperature of about 150 degrees C all the way to 250 degrees C. And what is the product? The product for this one is ethane. Now we have converted an alkene to an alkane. Have a look at that, now you see. Well, I should add the formula here. This is now going to be a C2. H6, and for the one to dichloro ethane, I'm going to put the formula as well. Now let me just erase that and add a little bit of space for this one. And then I put in the formula. So this is going to be a C2H4Cl2. You could draw the open structure if you wish and if you have enough space. But because of the time, space constraints that I got here, I'll just use the condensed formula. Now let's look at another reaction ethene can undergo. Ethene can also undergo a process we call combustion. Hmm. Combustion is where we are burning it in air. So we can put it like this, we go this way, and we have combustion. Combustion needs you to add a little bit of air and or oxygen. And of course, what are the two products that are formed there? It's going to be carbon dioxide and water. So I'm going to separate them like this. So here we get two products, which is carbon dioxide and water. Now, as you can see, our flowchart is taking shape now, and this is beginning to be fun right now. You see now, I know everything about ethene so far. Now also, ethane can undergo combustion and lead, lead to the same products. So it means that these two are interconnected. I could also do this and have it as combustion. And of course, I'll still be adding a little bit of air or oxygen and we get carbon dioxide in water. Well, moving forward, how can we get this to another level? Well, if I added water to another compound we call calcium carbide, then something interesting happens. Look at this. If I added calcium carbide, I end up with the next homologous series, which is ethane. Ethane, now I'll put it down here. Right there, yes. So you end up with ethane. Ethane is another homologous series. So you see here we have C2H4. Very well, and of course, this is going to also to give us another product, which is calcium hydroxide. So I could say here, plus calcium hydroxide. Well, that is another product for this reaction. Now you see, we already have how many homologous series here? One, two, three, and four homologous series so far. We have two more left we can represent here. And this one, we could start off with uh, ethanol. Let's go back to ethanol. Now for ethanol, hmm, what do we do to make it an alkanoic acid? That means ethanoic acid. Well, well, I would need to do oxidation. 
So here, what I need to do is I would add acidified potassium dichromate six or acidified potassium manganate seven. Well, well, where do I go? Let me go up this way. And I'm adding now acidified potassium manganate seven. You see that? Now what do we get? We end up with, we end up with ethanoic acid. This is ethanoic acid. And these are CH3COOH. This process that we have just talked about here is known as the oxidation. So this is oxidation of ethanol. Interestingly, if we now have a reaction between ethanol and ethanoic acid, we end up with another homologous series we call an ester. So this I could represent like this one plus this one. So if these two come together, then we end up with an alkanoic acid right here. So let me put that this way. I think I should use a different color here. Let me use black for the boxes. And of course, inside I'll put my green color. So here I'll end up with ethyl ethanoate. And that process is the process we call esterification. So these two, when they're added together, we end up with a process called esterification. This, of course, again takes place in the presence of some concentrated sulfuric six acid. So I'm going to put concentrated sulfuric six acid over there. It's a liquid to show it is concentrated. Then, of course, a little bit of warming would work here. So I need to warm. Those are the conditions. As for the formula for the ethyl hydrogen, ethyl ethanoate, I would end up with a CH3. COO, CH2, CH3. That is the formula for ethyl ethanoate. You could always draw the open structures and stuff. Then ethyl ethanoate also can be converted back to ethanol and ethanol acid using a process we call acidic hydrolysis. So that I could represent here like this, whereby now we have acidic hydrolysis. For acidic hydrolysis, you just need dilute sulfuric six acid or dilute hydrochloric acid. This, place, this process also takes place in the presence of some heat, so there's some warming. And it's actually the reverse of esterification. So we end up with the two products or the two reactants we started off with, that is ethanol, and ethanoic acid. So I'm gonna put them here like this. So here we end up with ethanol and ethanoic acid. Now, as you can see, we have represented all the homologous series and some of the reactions that ethene undergoes. We also have another reaction that it think could undergo. Maybe if we added something like, let me see, what about you added bromine water to eating? This thing is always tested in uh, paper three, mostly. So we'll find that we could say, what if we added here another arrow and end up with bromine water, H O B R. That will give us bromoethanol. So we end up with the compound called bromoethanol. Bromoethanol is going to be a CH2Br, CH2OH. So that is the condensed formula for bromoethanol. As you can see already, we have created an amazing flow diagram 
that can be used to remind ourselves of all these reactions. And all the reactions are connected in one way or another, as you can see. You could start off with an alkene, end up with an alkyne, you could start off with an alkane, end up with an alkanoic acid, and so on and so forth. So these are very powerful way of condensing your notes and revising. So apart from the sniper notes and the crystal clear tables, now I want you to add on to your list mind maps. And you will create mind maps on your own. Do not even hesitate. You can do it together with other students. You can do it alone. Whichever way you do it is going to enhance your understanding of organic chemistry incredibly. Now, I'll give you a task. So now, instead of uh, me just going through all this alone, I'd like you now to take up this task. So this is going to be your task today. So let me see, assignment. The assignment here is now, I want you to make your own mind maps. Make your own mind maps. Starting with the following. So let this be your starting reagent in your mind map. So number one, I want you to start off with propene or prop one in. Then I would like you to start another mind map starting with ethane. Start another mind map starting with, let's say, Propan, maybe propanol, or propan one, all. You could also have another one that you could start off with something like ethanoic acid. Yeah, keep it simple. Try this for, and once you've created your mind map, you can send it over, I check it out for you. Don't hesitate. Otherwise, that was my aim today just to make sure that you have understood what it's meant to create a mind map and how to use it as a very powerful revision tool. I can assure you that all through the years my students have used mind maps and they have done very well so you too are going to do very well if you use these mind maps. Don't forget that always keep the faith and make sure that you never ever never ever give up. Bye-bye. See you next time.